Hello and welcome to this session, The Law of Forgiveness. This is a great lesson, an absolutely phenomenal lesson. It's a lesson that I was taught many years ago. I never really learned it when I was taught it, but I never forgot it. And I kept working at it and kept working at it, and finally I did get it. And I can tell you from personal experience, it is one of the greatest lessons that I have ever learned. Raymond Hollywell starts out by quoting a scripture from Luke. Forgive, and ye shall be forgiven. I was talking to my partner here, Mary, and she asked me what my definition of forgiveness was, and I said to let go of completely, abandon. To let go of completely, abandon. And then she gave me an excellent one. Well, this is a definition I've heard from A Course in Miracles, and this definition has worked for me as I've applied it. It simply is this. Forgiveness is a shift in perception that removes a block in me to my awareness of love's presence. I want to hear it again so I know that everyone listening wants to hear it again. Okay. Forgiveness is a shift in perception, and that shift in perception removes a block in me to my awareness of love's presence or the power of all that is right here. So when I'm feeling non-forgiving, what it creates in me is a block in my awareness. Forgiveness is a shift in perception that removes a block in me to my awareness of love's presence. Do you know to shift your perception is no easy thing when something very mean has been placed in your road by someone that you may trust. And they did something that isn't very nice. And to forgive takes a big person. And of course, Raymond Hollywell starts out with that. He said there are crucial things in life that call for great human qualities. Our present fear is that man will not be big enough to meet the demands of the day. Well, that's not a fear that I have. I really believe we will become big enough to meet the demands of the day, and I think we are becoming big enough. I have been in this business now for 39 years, and I've studied it for just about 50 years. So I have seen a tremendous change in the consciousness of business and industry all over the world, because I've traveled all over the world in it. And people are becoming wiser. People are becoming much more aware. And to make that shift in perception requires awareness. It requires an awareness of what forgiveness really is. If we go way back, you learn many of these lessons from your religious sources, whether you're Christian, Muslim, Buddhist. It really doesn't make any difference. It could be in the Torah, the Bhagavad Gita, the Bible. One of the apostles from the Bible, Peter, the disciple, was greatly perplexed one time while listening to one of the many lessons of the master. He raised the question, which is the basis of this lesson. He turned to Jesus and he said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Until seven times? I mean, that was his question. That was a pretty generous gesture on his part. For the Jewish law, which he had known, allowed a person to be forgiven three times. This was more than twice the grace that the law allowed. So Peter must have felt that his Lord would be pleased with his extension of forgiveness. But that didn't cut it. And the answer came back and said, "Uh uh-uh, seven times isn't going to fly, Peter. It's got to be 70 times seven (laughs) <laughs> no, now think about that. Seventy times seven. There'd be no limit or restrictions. You see, the quality of forgiveness must be as limitless as faith and hope and love. Now, man's power to forgive sins are, I believe, among the least understood of all commands. As a rule, there's a separation made between sin and its many effects. Now, You know, a lot of people say, well, what is sin? Well, I heard a definition that I've adopted and I believe is just about as good as any you're going to find. Sin is transgression of the law. Like the law says, given, you'll receive. Well, it would be a sin if you try and get. So 
It's a word that can be used, I suppose, in different ways. That's my understanding of it. Well, when a person sins, we've been taught to think that this was a job for the minister. They were going to help them. And then somebody else says, no, it's a job for the doctor. As we violate the laws, what are we really doing? We're putting ourselves into the wrong vibration. Something goes haywire inside of us. If you're trying to get, given it everything you've been taught, you want to be a good little go-getter, and it keeps eluding you, you know, something wrong here. The idea is to give and you'll receive. Well, a person's trying to get. That violates the law. Energy returns to its source of origination. Give and you'll receive. Well, when we violate the law, we cause all kinds of frustrations. We put ourselves in a bad vibration and uh, all kinds of things start to happen. When you move into a bad vibration, your body starts to break down. Do you think it's an accident that a person in their 30s is taking a heart attack? That's really not an accident. Why do young people have strokes? That's not an accident. We get so uptight, we're so stressed, there's so much bad blood in things that things go wrong. But when we're living in harmony with the law, we freely flow. Everything within us goes. So let's suppose you've done something to me that is really mean. And rather than reacting and hating and resenting and cursing you, I forgive you. Now, I was saying that the definition to abandon, to let go of completely, I just let it go. I do not spend any time thinking about it. And I go on thinking about my goals and the good that I can do and what I can give. I'm going to be in a great vibration. But let's suppose I put up a fight and I go around and I resent you. I really, gee, I can't stand you. I'm, and I'm building hate and it's growing inside of me. What kind of a vibration I'm in? You can be out having a great time and I can be getting sick. Why? It's not because of what you did to me. It's how I'm reacting to what you did to me. We've got to learn how to work with these laws, and we've got to learn how to forgive, to let go. I think there's two emotions that are probably about as dangerous and as damaging as any that you'll come across. One is guilt, and the other is resentment. We've got to learn to forgive ourselves. If you've done something wrong in the past, you probably did the only thing you could do with the consciousness you had. Let it go. Forgive yourself. If someone else has done something wrong, don't resent them. Let it go. Forgive them. And you're putting beautiful energy in your mind then. You're free to think great thoughts, and you can keep on moving in the right direction. Forgiveness is not something that benefits the other person. Forgiveness benefits you. You're the recipient of the good when you forgive. Think about it. It'll soon fall into place. I know when I first became aware of this, I thought, yeah, I never thought of it that way. For me, this is one of the most important laws because it puts us in harmony with the great good in the universe. Non-forgiveness blocks our awareness of the good that is ever seeking to express itself in our thinking, our actions, and our experience. The Buddha said that to not forgive, to hold resentment, is like picking up a hot coal all the while intending to throw that hot coal at the recipiency of your frustration, your anger, your resentment. But nevertheless, when we hold that coal, the person who gets most burned is us. Someone else once said that non-forgiveness is like every day as we hold resentment, taking a little bit of poison, but intending the other person is going to be the one to die. So this is a shift in perception that we're talking about now that really puts us in a whole new state of mindedness. And remember that the originating place of all our experience is the mind. So why then would this teacher that we're talking about say to us 70 times 7, and I can tell you this, that no matter what tradition you are or what philosophy you ascribe to, if you look at the core of it, you will find somewhere in the tenets the idea of learning the power of forgiveness. So why 70 times 7? Because it's the same thing as brushing our teeth or taking a shower, that there is a cleansing in the mental field that forgiveness does. It cleanses misperceptions. It puts us in a higher vibration. And from the vibration we're holding issues all the matters of life. I had a friend once, I think you were friends with him too, Bob, Jack Bolin. 
Yes. And he used to say, when I was young, there were certain people who were simply not safe to walk down the streets of my mind <laughs> because I would attack them. And I bet that some of us right now have some people in our history or maybe in our current experience who are not safe to walk down the streets of our mind, that as soon as we think of their name, as soon as we think of what happened in our relationship with them, we can feel a contraction in our energy. We feel perhaps even some heat on our neck. Hollowell says, scientists accept the truth that the body of man is moved by the mind and all its functionings are governed by a ruling thought, whether that thought is subjective or objective, whether it's conscious or unconscious. So when you've made a mistake or I've made a mistake or someone in your relationship life, whether it's business or personal, has made a mistake, we form a perception about that mistake. Now, it doesn't mean that we want to invite that experience back in our lives when we forgive it. It just means we remove our charge on that experience. You and I charge every experience with an opinion. And we decide this is good or this is not good. And when we claim that it is not good, we have simply removed ourselves from the opportunity to transform that experience, claim it's good, use that good as a lever for our ever upward movement in the spiral of becoming. So when we remove the negative charge from our opinion on an experience we've had, we experience this shift in perception. And the good that is ever present in this life experience itself, can make itself known to us. Raymond Hollywell asked an important question. Who can tell what the law is? That is a real good question, because if a person is not reasonably well-read, the law wouldn't make any sense to them at all. We're born into a physical body. We correspond with a material world. We're programmed to live through our physical senses. Our senses are given to us so we can correspond and communicate with the material world. By our senses, I mean you can see, hear, smell, taste, touch. Well, that puts you in touch with your outside world. We're taught very little about our higher faculties and virtually nothing about the law. Now, anyone who studies man, the human being, as both a mental and a physical being, can understand the law. But if we're not studying and really understanding the true personality, like we're truly a triune being, we live simultaneously on three planes of understanding. But if a person doesn't understand that, trying to digest this concept of the law is not going to be an easy thing to do. It's going to seem like a theory of some religious creature that lived many moons ago. But if you study into it and you really take a look at the structure of the human personality, then it starts to make sense. If we try to learn the law by studying the physical actions or the result of sin alone, you're not going to learn it. It would lead to nowhere. Keep in mind, when we talk about sin, it's a violation of the law. When you violate the law, you pay a price. See, the individual that does not grasp this would be running around in circles, and it would be useless and futile for them to try and grasp it. Now, if we go deeper and study the causes which prompted this kind of behavior we're referring to as sin, you're going to get results. But we've got to analyze a case and search for some harbored, hidden, forgotten shock or condition that would have caused the illness. So, Let's suppose we're involved in the healing arts, and all we understand is the physical. We don't understand anything beyond the physical. Well, you're going to be trying to correct something in the body by treating the body. I'm not saying you shouldn't do that, but I do say that you're treating a symptom. You're not treating the cause of the problem at all. Now, there was a doctor who I have gained just tremendous insight from, Dr. Thurman Fleet, who lived back around 1935. He was very involved in the healing arts, and he said, you know, if we're just treating the body, we're treating symptoms. If we're going to treat the cause of the problems, we've got to go beyond that. We have all kinds of psychology, psychiatry, behavioral scientists trying to figure out why people do things. And so we're looking at behavior all the time and trying to change the behavior. We say the behavior causes the result. Well, the behavior does cause the result, but I think what we have to ask is what causes the behavior? We've got to go to the primary cause of the problem, and that's where you get inside. And unless we get inside, we're going to be lost. A noted physician 
talking before a group of other medical people on the very subject of thought being the source of disease was recorded as having said in his concluding remarks, Abnormal tumors and cancers are due to a long period of suppressed grief and anxiety. Another way of saying that such diseases are due to a lot of sinful thoughts getting bottled up and suppressed within the mind. Now, if a person happens to be ill, they're going to have a very difficult time accepting that. And if they don't accept it, they're going to have a difficult time changing it. We've got to understand it. I remember reading in a book, I think it was on page 367, in a book, Three Magic Words by U.S. Anderson, and he talked about cancer being caused by suppression. I was speaking at a meeting one time in Denver, and there were doctors and some medical people in the audience from the Presbyterian Hospital, which I believe is a cancer hospital in Denver, and they come back and they said, you know what you're saying, we believe is right. It is caused by suppression. Another way of saying this, that such diseases are due to a lot of wrong thinking, erratic thinking even, getting bottled up and suppressed in our mind. In this state, it's so destroying when we get the wrong thinking, unlawful thoughts running, it might be wise for us to probe into our own selves and note the effect our emotions have upon the physical organism. Then let us seek by every means at our command to overcome, abandon, and forsake every emotional tug that has a debilitating or disturbing effect. There's another leading psychiatrist that has said that most of the cases of mental disorder of functional type are due to a sense of guilt. I'll have to tell you here that I used to be bothered by guilt, just terrible feelings. And when I look back in my own life, I realized I was raised with guilt. But that wasn't unusual. Probably everyone in my particular area was raised with guilt. And it was really bothering me. So I went to see a psychiatrist, and I met with him maybe four or five times. I was on my way down for a visit because I had an appointment, and I realized I didn't have to go anymore. So I phoned him, and I told him, I said, I don't have to come anymore. He said, I didn't think you'd be back anymore. But he said, come on down anyway, because I want to talk to you. And he wanted to do some work with me. He was fascinated with the work I was doing. All he did was ask questions, but he asked questions, and he provoked me to think. He caused me to take a look at how absolutely ridiculous guilt is. I think Maxwell Maltz put it very well in his book, Psycho-Cybernetics. He said that guilt is never an appropriate emotion, which is a good way of looking at it. There are some harbored and congested thoughts that need forgiveness. Usually a sick mind fears to release them or to forgive them. This is natural. For if they were able to release and forgive the fearful thoughts, they would no longer be sick-minded. Well, we're not sick-minded. We're rational individuals, we're thinking individuals, and we're raising our level of consciousness. We're increasing our level of awareness and becoming more and more aware of the healthy concept that forgiveness represents. I want to suggest you listen to this message often and make sure if you have any guilt or resentment that you let it go. Bob, the lesson you just gave us on guilt, I think, is so important in the understanding of the application of the law of forgiveness. For any of us who are listening to this message right now, if and trying to understand this law and seeking to have a greater understanding and experience of its power in our lives, there's not one of us who doesn't look back in our life, and whether we've had a cancer experience or we've had some kind of illness experience, to be told and to begin to realize that the dis-ease that's in my body has a direct relationship to what has been harbored and held in my mind. If we're not aware, it can actually generate a sense of guilt, like, oh my gosh, I must be a bad person to have given myself. I had kidney disease. I was told I wasn't going to survive it. And fortunately, a woman who was a metaphysician and knew these laws came and spoke to me and helped me see that the toxicity that was going on in my body had a direct relationship to the toxic shame that I had been repeating and holding and feeling and energizing for a good year. That began to liberate me, not immediately, but over time as I began to apply self-forgiveness. There was a study at Harvard where they spoke about the genius mind and what is required for us to be a genius. And they revealed in their study that about 99.9% of all babies operate at a genius mind. And they described the genius mind as a mind that 
operates on all modalities, takes in information with all modalities, kinesthetically, vibrationally, intuitively, intellectually, physically, all the many modalities within which we can take in information and then synthesizes or makes use of that information. And a baby freely does that. By the time we're five, only 20% of us are capable of doing that. And by the time we're 20, only 2% are capable of operating from the genius mind. What happens to us? Well, their research said that it was the learned voice of internal judgment, where we have a general way of raising our kids the way we were raised, which is a shamed-based parenting model. And so we create kids like Bob describes of growing up with himself feeling guilty, and he chose to overcome that. And the point here is that it doesn't matter what's happened in our upbringing. There is a power in us that is greater. And as we diminish the voice of internal judgment and we learn the truth and we apply these laws and apply these principles, we are liberated. We are liberated from the constraints that have held us down, and we open to a whole new experience. Hollowell talks about Professor Gates of the Psychological Laboratory of Washington, D.C., doing an experiment in testing the emotions and the reactions of the body. And he found some interesting results. He found that there were 40 what he called negative emotions and many, many, many more emotions that actually were positive. And here's how he described what was positive and what was negative. He said, of all the negative emotions, the reaction of guilt was the worst. And this deduction was gained by a chemical analysis of the perspiration taken from the body. A small quantity of perspiration was taken from each emotional reaction, and then it was tested. And negative emotions show a strong acid in the testing. Now, if you put some acid on your flesh, I mean, you know what's going to happen. It burns. And if it's allowed to continue to burn, it produces a painful experience, and it actually destroys the very tissue of your flesh. Now, this is just a chemical reaction that is affecting the tissue and organism of our physical body. When these destroying thoughts are harbored and allowed to generate a poison that actually weakens our immune system and eventually breaks down our body. We've heard the phrase, he's burning mad, or I've got a hot temper, or they're cold as steel, that we say these things because deep down we really know that there is a physical reaction to the thoughts that produce the emotions that we're holding. Bob and I both have a friend whose name is Cynthia Kersey, and she's a very, very successful woman and runs a terrific company called Unstoppable. And she told me once that in her divorcing process, she was so hurt by her former husband and so deeply, deeply wounded by the feelings of betrayal that she was harboring. And she got herself into therapy, and the particular therapist she was seeing after a while said to her that she thought Cynthia would really need to really feel her anger and really experience and allow herself to process through her anger, and that it would probably take her maybe six months to work out her anger. She told me then that just the next week she talked to Bob Proctor, her friend, and she shared with him what she was doing, that she was healing from this, and that she was going to allow herself to really feel her anger for about six months and work it out. And she said what Bob said to her changed her life because Bob said to her, well, you could be angry for six months or you could do something more interesting. And she said, well, like what? And he said, find something you care about more than your anger. Find something that you feel if you did this in the world, it would motivate you. It would give you life. It would be something way bigger than the hurt you're feeling. And she considered that. The next week she met Millard Fuller who was the founder of Habitat for Humanity. And they were doing some work in Nepal. And Cynthia went to Nepal, and she saw that there were women there who, because of the vision of women in Nepal, no way to make their own homes, no way to, if they were divorced or if they were widowed, that their children, they were living on streets. And Cynthia got the idea to help gather her resources and get others to help her, and that she would make some homes for the women in Nepal. And she asked herself, how can I do this? And where will I find the resources? And she thought, okay, how many homes would I have to build that would be bigger than the hurt I'm feeling? And she heard inside herself 100 homes. And Cynthia Kersey, through these laws, built over 100 homes for women in Nepal. There is a power in you that is bigger than the hurt you feel. It's interesting you bring that story up. That was the first time I had talked to Cynthia Kersey. Really? I had known her before that. I would talked to her on the phone, but I met her. And we met in the uh, Marriott Hotel, LAX. I can still see us sitting there in the dining room and talking about that. She had to raise $200,000. Now, she not only raised the money, she got a group of people to go with her, and she went to Nepal, and she went between Christmas and New Year's. She was a changed woman when she came back from that. 
she did a tremendous amount of work with that organization. But what she really did was a tremendous amount of work with herself. Mm -hmm. And she's probably one of the happiest people I know. She's very relaxed within herself. She let it go sitting there in that restaurant, just released it and let it go. And she started to laugh. It made so much sense. And she said it was so easy once she understood it. So if we can see this situation and use Cynthia as an example, what idea are you harboring? What kind of a negative concept are you permitting to rent space in your mind? Because I would evict it immediately if I were you. If you can look at it like a weed, weeds do not remove themselves in time. They really don't. We think, well, if we leave it there long enough. No, if you leave it there long enough, it is not going to go away. It didn't get there by accident. It's not going to leave by accident. Instead, the weeds are going to increase and grow stronger until they choke out the flower. Well, the same is true of any wrong weed thoughts. Earl Nightingale brought that up very beautifully in his recording, The Strangest Secret. He said, you know, the mind is like a garden, and he said it's many times more fertile than the garden. He said, you can plant corn, a sweet food, or nightshade, a deadly poison. One will grow with just as great an abundance as the other. They can be planted side by side. And one will grow just the same as the other. Well, in the garden of our memory, they must be plucked out, cast out, and destroyed so that the only flowers are healthy, happy thoughts that grow in here. Every person is tempted to draw away from this. Like our old programming has a tendency to want to hate, to want to hold on to that bad thought. They did bad to me, and I'm not going to let them off the hook. Well, It's not them we're letting off the hook. It's ourself we're letting off the hook. And so the more we think about this, the more we review this lesson, this law of forgiveness, the more sense it's going to make. I spend a lot of time thinking about this. I think it's probably one of the most liberating concepts anyone's ever going to come across. We've got all kinds of ideas in our mind that were planted there long before we were even aware of what was going on. Some of them, they're genetic. They're passed along in the genes from our relatives. It's part of our gene pool. And then in our little life, they're planted. Our subconscious mind had no ability to reject it in our little life. Well, these unlawful thoughts have been planted, and they're causing us great problems. Do you think it's an accident when a person is so shy they can't even look at someone or they can't talk to someone? That is a weed-type thought in the mind. We can get rid of those. How do we get rid of them? Well, we get rid of them, first of all, by understanding that they're there. We want to realize that if there's a result or a behavior pattern that we are not pleased with, that we know are not causing good things to come into our life, that the cause of it is an idea in our subconscious mind. And what we want to do is plant an idea that's essentially the opposite to the one that's causing the problem. I have recommended on numerous occasions that if a person isn't happy with the results they're getting, to take a look at the behavior that's causing it. Take a look at the nature of the result they don't like. And I said, take two sheets of paper, put a negative sign at the top of one and a positive sign at the top of the other one. And then recognize the one you don't like in all its negativity and write it out exactly as you see it. You know, how bad it makes you feel and how terrible it actually is. And then say, now what would be the polar opposite to that? And begin the other one by saying, I am so happy and grateful, now that. And go ahead and write it out. If there's disease in your body that you've described on the negative side, I'm so happy and grateful now that every fiber of my being is vibrating in perfect harmony with God's laws. My body's getting happier and healthier and stronger every second of every day. Write that on the positive one. Then take and literally burn the negative one. It's merely symbolic. Do it anyway. And then keep rewriting the positive one. Keep rewriting it. Writing causes thinking. Thinking creates an image. The image stirs the emotion. Think about it. Every word is an image. Every image sets up an action in the mind. And the more you do this, the more you're planning the idea, pretty soon that new idea is going to take root. And you know what's going to happen? 
the other one's going to die for a lack of nourishment. And this new idea is going to take over, and your mind and body are free. You've let it go. You forgave it. You know, Bob, when you burn that, when we burn that, and I've had that experience, and I use that process, and I really encourage those of you that are listening to this to do this. Out of habit, you may want to pick it up again with your mind, but now that you've burned it, you have impressed. It burned in my memory. Well, you let that happen. You say, no, I let this go, and immediately turn your attention differently. I had the opportunity, Bob, to be with the Dalai Lama a few times in my life and work, actually sit right next to him for five days at a time. If there's anybody on our planet that we could expect might have a little resentment about what's happened in his life, over 50 years, the Chinese government has been acting in ways that brought a decimation to a culture on our planet. He has no resentment in him. There are many, many people who are still in prison there. All the temples have been destroyed. It's an uninformed thinking, of course, that would bring this about. But nevertheless, his response and his way of being... I kept waiting for just even a little wave or feeling of resentment or anger about what's happened to him, his culture, or his people. He works vigorously for the return of Tibet to the Tibetan people. But while he's doing that, he has a way of thinking about it that creates the experience that is such a high teaching. And he says, we all have our friends, and then we have our sacred friends. And our sacred friends are the ones that it's very difficult to forgive. You know, you get cut out of traffic. It's easy to forgive that. But when someone you have deeply loved, you have really opened your heart, you have trusted with your money or your business or something you care deeply about, and then you are betrayed to forgive in that moment, Gene Houston says, to forgive in this moment has evolutionary potency for our soul. It puts us on a whole new plane of being and power. There was a man once who came to me who was trying to understand the law of forgiveness, and I sat with him, and he shared with me his story. He was a man who ran with gangs when he was in college and got involved in drugs, and he spent some time in prison, and his way of solving problems had always been physical violence. And he went to prison for that. He got out of prison. He got into recovery, and he was 15 years down the path. He'd been married, had a wonderful wife, or so he thought. And then his wife said she wanted a separation, and he was just heartbroken, and he was getting with his friend Bruce and telling him about how heartbroken he was, that the wife was not wanting to be together anymore, and Al was pouring his heart out to Bruce, all the while Bruce was seeing Al's wife. And when Al found out that Bruce, who had supposedly been his best friend all the time, had been seeing his wife, who was now separated from him, he wanted so much just to revert to his old patterns of using physical violence or finding some way to take Bruce out. But he'd done enough recovery and enough understanding that he knew he couldn't do that, but he didn't know what else to do. So he came to me, and I sat down with him. I said, you know, Al, you just got to forgive him. He says, I forgive that. SOB. I can't forgive that guy. What am I and I said, here's the deal. Ultimately, you got to get yourself to the place where when you think of him, you can wish him well and pray for that. You have a higher power. The great thing about having a higher power is it's higher. Call upon the part of you that can. And you can start your prayer any way you want to. But ultimately, get yourself over time to the place where you can think of Bruce and wish him well. So he came back in a couple of weeks, and I didn't know how he had done it, but I knew that he'd made a shift because his whole energy was lighter. He was more relaxed in his body. You could feel him having come a long way down the path from where he was two weeks prior when I'd met with him. And I said, so how are you doing? And he says, well, I'm not done with this, but I'm making progress. And I said, so how do you do this? And he says, well, you said I could start the prayer any way I wanted to, so I started it this way. Dear God, if a truck doesn't run over Bruce first, then may he do well. Dear God, if a train doesn't smash him flat. And he said, I had a whole lot more energy on a train smashing him flat or a truck running over him. But over time, as I kept at it and kept at it, I, one day it occurred to me, I really do want him to do well. I want everybody to do well. And if I really want the woman I've loved to do well, I want her to be happy. I began to feel a new release in me. I really do want everybody to do well. And so forgiveness sometimes is a process. If we just will work with this law, it's easy. It's the most natural thing in the world. Just in listening to that story, there's a side of us that understands why he would be so angry and then there's another side that understands that the law is the only way to go. What we've got to do is get to the point that that man got to where that's the normal and natural way that we operate. Raymond Hollowell brings out a good point here. 
He said, some people ask if we believe in canceling monetary obligations of those who owe us, or literally should we cancel the debt of our debtors? There were a number of people in the past months, he said, who have made the front page in the newspaper because they wrote off their books with receipts in full to all who owed them. Now, did this eliminate the debts? Good question. Well, the debtors were loud in their praises for such a generous soul, but they came right back to do more business with the grocer or the butcher and asked them to charge it. In other words, they were glad to be relieved of the debt charged against them, but they knew no different than to return and open an account. The answer is that so long as we believe in the necessity and reality of debt, such debt will continue to endure. So long as we believe in debts, we shall get into debt and continue to collect all the burdens and headaches that come with them. He who does not, in his own thought, release all people who owe him stands liable himself to fall into debt. If we send receipted bills to all who owe us, Would that relieve us from the burden of debt? No. The signing of the receipts does not erase the idea of debt from our mind. First, we must erase from our mind the thought that anyone can owe us anything. This, then, will bring us into a clear atmosphere in which we sow seeds or ideas of abundance for those who are indebted to us. In this way, the debtor will find their mind more fertile soil to bring forth thoughts of abundance. When they catch the spirit of the free-flowing thought of plenty, they'll be happy to pay their debts, and all that is justly ours will come to us cheerfully. In other words, when we free our mind from all thoughts of debt and try to realize more and more the presence of plenty, we shall soon be strong enough to reach out and realize abundance for our debtors. And they are lifted up from our thoughts of limitation and lack. They'll attract more and more substance with which they can pay their bills. In this way, and in the only way, can debt be permanently canceled. Through applying the law of forgiveness, both parties concerned will be lifted from a debt consciousness to a prosperous consciousness, and prosperity and plenty shall be abound. Now, that's a lesson that most people never really learn. It's huge. I often tell people in seminars, if your goal is to get out of debt, you're probably going to stay in debt forever. Because I said, whatever you think about, you attract. And they'll say, but it's to get out of debt. And I said, I don't care if it's get out or get in. If you're thinking debt, you're going to attract debt. We've got to get rid of the idea of debt and see only abundance. We're living in an abundant universe. There's an infinite source of supply. We've got to see all the good that we want and know that it's flowing freely to us. Now, as long as we have those weed thoughts, those thoughts of obstruction in our mind, it's not going to flow freely. But when we understand that, we're not only going to want it for ourselves, we're going to want it for everyone because that's all you see. If I look at you and I see lack and limitation in your life, who's entertaining the lack and limitation? It's me. It's in my mind, not yours. So we've got to see abundance. We've got to see happiness, fulfillment. And when we do, that's when we're free. Forgiveness is a phenomenal concept. And the practice, of course, is to hold that thought even in the presence of what appears to be its absence. That we look at someone and on a ledger sheet, it looks like they owe us money. Or we look at someone and it looks like their life is in some form of less than it could be from our viewpoint. But to shift our perception because what anchors it in us is our perception. So be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It is a practice then to practice this law of forgiveness, to shift our perception so that when we come upon the thought and particularly the feeling of debt, to shift that perception to the anchoring in our own minds and in our own feeling nature, a remembering and then a repatterning of the abundance that is everywhere present. Now, every one of us must walk this path of forgiveness. We don't get out of this life without that curriculum. And I actually believe that this idea of forgiveness in the presence of betrayal has evolutionary potency for our soul. 
there's not one person who doesn't have the experience of betrayal. It's only its size or magnitude. Whether you feel that your body betrayed you because you had an illness and before you understand that you're a co-participant in your own wellness, if you feel like a business partner cheated you, if you feel like someone you loved hurt you, it doesn't matter what form or face it brings. It is the curriculum of becoming, the unveiling of the power and the authority that indwells every one of us. And step by step, stage by stage in our awareness and our understanding and our growth and our becoming, the employment of the practice of forgiveness, not once, not thrice, not seven times, 70 times seven, it's a way of being where every single day we look at where am I out of alignment with my own thinking that would create a constriction in my feeling. And any place we are not at ease, we know that we have thought wrongly. But we can choose again. I actually believe we are wired in such a way that when we are in harmony with the law of being or the law of life, we actually feel better. We feel more alive. We feel more creative. And we can pay attention to that let it be a compass and let it guide us. And I'm going to close this session with a story with an example my husband gave me. He said, you know, when you're standing by the fire, you can get really burned. But if you pay attention and an ash comes out and it lands on your jacket, flick it off right away and it won't burn your jacket at all. So thoughts of discord are all around. But the moment you notice them, flick them off and go back to thoughts of good. This is Mary Morrissey. And this is Bob Proctor. Thank you. Thank you.